Hello, Dr. Alsati. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you so much. Uh, Absolutely. Despite your busy, despite your busy schedule, you are taking time to teach us. Okay. This is I will figure it out, it's okay. Um, I'm glad I was able to make it today. So um, let's see, whenever you guys want me to start, I will go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, let me, um, you can start sharing your screen. Okay, we'll wait for a few minutes until everybody is in. And yeah. um, this way we can all uh, look together. And uh, I am only going to be doing a GI, no liver, of course. Of course, of course, yeah. 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 Those so uh, liver is for... Yeah, I will be skipping uh, some of the... Uh, of course, of course, of course. And yeah. we can also skip uh, the diagnoses that are easy, like endometriosis, we don't need to see anymore. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. We can also skip those diagnoses, like those okay. are easy diagnoses, yeah. All right. Okay, so you guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> so... I went to the University of, Mer uh, of Michigan virtual slide box, and I'm starting with um, the GI pathology slides, skipping few. So the first one is going to be um, esophagus barrett mucosa with high grade dysplasia. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see. So um, first thing I look at right now is whether or not they call it squamous, they call it um, uh, Barrett mucosa. So I'm, I'm, ho I'm hoping I have some squamous epithelium and there it is. So that confirms the location. So uh, second of all, I do have squamojunctional type mucosa and columnar epithelium with goblet cells, right? So this is uh, an easy diagnosis. I shouldn't have a problem with that. However, this is just 1% of the diagnosis because everybody can tell you whether or not this is Barrett, but uh, missing dysplasia is so easy. So we keep an eye on the surface, okay? And um, let's say we, we're looking at this area. This for me is a huge red flag as a GI pathologist. I look at it, I am, I am used to have pencil shaped or a small basally located nuclei on my columnar epithelium with goblet cells. This focus I have high power is you can see there is a goblet cell here, let's say. And so we have almost like almost goblet cell de depletion. It is a little crowded and your, your nuclei becoming more rounded rather than elongated. And I don't like that. And your nuclei are going all the way to the surface, all the way to the top. This is. In my, in my opinion, this is not even low grade. This is right away a high grade lesion, okay? So your, my, my key point is the surface. You're looking at the surface and it, it doesn't look okay to me. So I keep follow. So my threshold now is I'm probably gonna call it high grade. I'm probably gonna call it high grade. Let's see if I, if now I have to screen all of my surfaces. Here, here to my eye, it's probably low grade a lot of goblet cells see how there is like lots of intestinal metaplasia and the nuclei are still pencil shaped. Are, most of them are basally located and some of them are reaching the top, but even the one reaching the top are also pencil shaped. So to me, this focus is a low grade dysplasia focus. Okay, now I keep going, I keep looking, I keep looking. Uh, the first one I sat, I, I laid my eye on was not, was not good at all. Here, this is another focus, although this one, um, is, uh, is not, uh, I'm not pretty sure if it's a surface or not, but um, this roundiness, this whole group here have rounded nuclei. Um, I'm, I'm spending a little bit more on this one just because how serious this diagnosis is. We need to be very careful when we're, um, we're giving the patient a high grade lesion because management really differs. Look at that. Um, the surface has rounded nuclei and all the way into the deep, they're, they're all become rounded. They're no longer pencil shaped, they're no longer small. And there's a lot of anisonucleosis, difference in shapes and sizes. 
and here's a small squamous area at the squamoglandular junction mucosa. And just keep an eye, the more high grade it becomes, the less goblet cells you will see, okay? So it is a soft sign, but almost goblet cell depletion in Barrett esophagus is a more in favor of high grade dysplasia, okay? And you go further here, it's very ugly. This one, I would definitely call it Barrett with high grade. And of course, I'll show it around. Just keep um, keep an eye on things that you need to show around. This is one of the things you have to show around because management does differ in those patients. They will have an EMR, um, and they will have uh, uh, some and some with very recurrent. And if it comes multiple times to them, the patient may choose to remove that segment of the esophagus. So um, it's not a, don't take it this diagnosis lightly. Okay. So this is Barrett with high grade. Let's move on. Next is, um, uh, oh yeah, this is a nice one. This is a colon. They're calling it cystoplasmosis. Oh no, I don't want to see this first. I want to see the, the H and E first. So I'm hoping this is an H and E. Perfect. So this is an H and E. Um, uh, again, I know there is a lot of inflammation in the lamina propria and submucosa, but your eye has to start with your epithelium. Make sure you're not getting cancer in your epithelium. It seems like it's eroded epithelium. Okay, here, right here in the center, I have a multinucleated giant cell. And so I know that this colon is reacting to something. I still look at the surface. Surface is eroded, ulcerated. And then I look closer, deep into my uh, lamina propria and submucosa. And I see, let's see. Um, it's not the easiest thing to pick on H and E, so that's why I'm I'm taking my time to do that. But definitely, uh, a GMS is very very important in this case. It's almost like a granulomatous inflammation here. You see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a little granuloma, epithelioid granuloma. So your GMS is a for sure a must here also to rule out. Uh, um, I'm sorry, AFB is also a must here. Mm. Okay. Uh, where are they? And this, the great. clarity is not that great as well. I mean, it's uh, it will be hard to see in uh, here. Yeah. Present. Okay. Let's 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 look at the GMS. It, it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be highlighted much. There you go. Yeah. Here you go. See how you have your histoplasmosis. Are you talking? No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm looking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, there you go. Wait, 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 wait. It's not a common diagnosis. I don't do it very often, but uh, it always have to stay in your mind to rule out histoplasmosis when you have epithelioid granulomas and... Uh, this must be an HIV patient. Probably. Okay. Where is my classic A histo? Hmm. <laughs> Trying to look for it. It's a big slide. Okay. I don't think this is histoplasmosis here. Is it? No, no, it doesn't look like that. Okay, I'm not sure. I will look at this case alone and maybe when uh, tomorrow when we start again, I will uh, go back to it and review it with you because right now I feel like I need to give it more time from my end to be more yeah. accurate before I give. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it's there because the his on histology, it looks like it is going to be a positive case, but we'll look into it. I don't want to waste your time, okay? All right, next case is, uh, okay, carcinoid tumor arising in a setting of autoimmune gastritis, okay? So what, what are we looking here? First of all, we wanna make sure that the stomach has absent oxygen gland. This confirms that it's a body, okay? And um, obviously you can see the carcinoid. It's, it's so big, it's so huge. 
but um, it's important always to, um, you know, link it to autoimmune gastritis. Um, so this is definitely an antralyzed gastric mucosa. Doesn't mean that carcinoids doesn't occur in, in, in antrums, but if the location clinically is a body, then this is definitely an autoimmune case. Mm -hmm. Let me confirm that this patient also has intestinal metaplasia of their body. There you go, see that? We have IM in the body. So um, that's a good sign that we're dealing with um, wow. uh, an autoimmune uh, gastritis. And this is the large carcinoid. So what do you do here? You do chromos, synapto, you do KI-67, and you give a measurement, okay? Because this all does affect the management of this patient, okay? And based on your KI-67, whether or not it's 2%, uh, you're a well-differentiated 2 to 20, uh, grade 2, and then more than 20, it's a grade 3 tumor. And um, yeah, so that's, that's what you need to keep in mind too. Dr. al have you ever seen like um, like small cell carcinoma or something like that that metastasized to the GI? No, um, I did see small cell carcinoma in the GI tract, but not uh, whether or not it metastasis, I, I can't tell. But I did call it um, uh, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, oh, actually, I called it neuroendocrine carcinoma. That's what I called it. Um, but it does look like poorly differentiated small cell type. So, um, and then, I mean, it was all positive for all the stains. KI67 was almost 90%. So, um, yeah, that's, that was, I think it was a, a stomach case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Can next? I ask a quick question? Yes, of course. Um, if of course, um, it is in the background of atrophic gastritis, but if it is a pure biopsy that was done for atrophic gastritis, would you do synapto and chromo and gastrin stains? Yes. Yeah. If, the, if the doctor mentions that rule out uh, atrophic gastritis, mm -hmm. but if I have very good occipital glands, I don't, what, I don't waste my time doing any stains because to me, yeah. this is not atrophic yet. But if I have antralyzed type mucosa in the body, I do order gastrin, make sure that this is a body. Mm -hmm. And then during my gastrin, I order a, a, a synapto, okay? Or a chromo if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then my chromo will tell me the ECL cell hyperplasia, is it nodular and cord-like? It will tell mm -hmm. me if there is much more ECL cells other than the ones I can see, you know? And it will make me, push me to do measurements or and push me to call it carcinoid, um, uh, microcarcinoids. So there's a whole list of things that you have to think about in autoimmune gastritis. Um, I would say around uh, six or seven a year, I have to count my nodules of carcinoid and do my measurements in patients with the AMAG. So um, not something that I do on a daily basis, but definitely five, six or seven a year is something also not very rare. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next is our, um, did he call it, what did he call it? Cystile? Cystile serrated adenoma and adenoma. So I should have two things here, okay? Which is very beautiful. This is our classic adenoma. Um, okay, so you have beautiful low-grade dysplasia and a polypoid matter. And then when it comes here like that, I have a habit of mentioning that it's, it's a single, single polypoid lesion, I'm um, sorry, the single polyp and my margin is negative, okay? Um, it's just, it's a, it's a practice that I take. Um, it seems like this came in one piece um, and that polyp has a negative margin over here, okay? And, um, and my cess cell serrated adenoma is this guy. And um, see, you have, it's either the exact, uh, exact um, uh, uh, widening from top to bottom, or even the bottom is more wider than the top. So uh, that's a nice case of cystile serrated adenoma. Once I call this cystile serrated adenoma, I look for low-grade dysplasia. I think I did mention that before. So a quick screening, quick screening. The way I look for it is I just look for darkness 
um, and I don't see anything and I move on, okay? Please don't forget to screen for this low grade dysplasia or high grade dysplasia in your SSH. And don't forget to screen for high grade dysplasias in your TAs. It is so common to overlook that, so um, keep that in mind. Okay, uh, this one is, uh, um, let's see, liver, 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 colon, angiodysplasia. Okay, let's look at that. It's not something that we went through before, so um, look at it together. Okay, this is uh, colonic mucosa, and uh, angiodysplasia is something that they can see clinically on, on, under the, on endoscopy, so it's not only our diagnosis. It'll become, it's erythematous, it's slightly raised, um, and when they do the light during endoscopy, it will look like very vascular for them. So they can tell you that this is angiodysplasia. Sometimes the, the, the biopsy comes to you with that label, okay? So for me is, um, I would call this polypoid colonic mucosa with um, uh, dilated thickened walled vessels within the lamina propria consistent with the clinical impression of angiodysplasia, okay? And also one thing to think about with angiodysplasia, you will have some hemosiderin leading macrophages, which is what the case here. And look how many vessels here. There's this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And they're all interrupting, interrupting the mucosa, okay? So it's kind of taking away some of the spaces where the glands are supposed to be there, okay? Um, so this is angiodysplasia. It's completely non-significant. There's nothing to worry about. Um, and it's of no clinical significance. Okay, moving on. So if you missed it, it's not the end of the world. Uh, Crohn's disease with endometriosis. This looks um, nice. So let's see. So let's do the first diagnosis, which is pretty, pretty easy, which is endometriosis, right? So we have here lots of stroma. These are going to be CD10 positive, CDX2 negative epithelium, and you're going to call this endometriosis, right? It's not... Um, it's, it's easy and you don't always have to stay for it, but it's, it's a neat diagnosis if you found it, okay? And uh, this is more of a tear. This whole thing is the endometrioid stroma or cellular periglandular stroma, okay? And then you have your actual epithelium. And where are we? Aha. Uh -huh. You didn't say Crohn's disease? So you said Crohn's disease. So I wonder if this is a terminal ileum with um, chronic ileitis look to it. And these are all pyloric gland metaplasia. Mm. Or, which I'm favoring, by the way, based on the elongated villi at the top. Okay, and you have active and chronic inflammation. And let's see, there are granuloma. Am I going so fast or are you okay with what I'm? You're doing perfectly. Okay. And um, is, there la is it lagging? Because for me, it's not lagging at all. Is, are you looking at my pictures for uh, the video? The, uh, screen sharing is also good. Yeah, it is. It is optimal. I mean, it's not the perfect, but it's optimal. Okay. All right. I don't see granuloma, but uh, maybe, maybe the patient has a history of Crohn's and me. Yeah, but if I am to guess, I think this is chronic ileitis, uh, mm -hmm. chronic active ileitis with endometriosis, and then I will do mention that the patient. Uh, in the, you know, this this is consistent with patient's history of uh, Crohn's disease and associated deposits of endometrial tissue consistent with um, endometriosis. Okay, so I will move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was correct. It was a small intestine. They wrote it okay. down there. Good. Uh, pancreas, liver, stomach, metastatic lobular carcinoma. Okay, so this is a stomach biopsy. Why is this so crucial? Because on low power, let's train our eyes right now to look on low power. On low power, it looks like an antrum, right? It looks like busy. Right now I am leaning towards calling 
already, already before even going high power, chronic gastritis because of how much the lamina propria to me appears busy. Let me see, now I wanna fix my diagnosis, whether or not I'm correct. So I give, I go high power, antrim, antrim, antrim. I'm fine, yeah. Well, maybe mild chronic gastritis. So look at the other piece, all right. Hmm, what's going on here? Neoplastic proliferation, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so my neoplastic proliferation is not on the main piece, okay? It's not here. So that's why it's very important to look at all your pieces thoroughly, very thoroughly. And um, here, I still don't see it. Maybe some here, neoplasm. These are all neoplastic proliferation. Mm -hmm. and, and here, okay. Now, very important for you to know that, okay, I do see my epithelium eroded. I do see, but I don't see intestinal metaplasia. And for me, I feel like this gland is intact and this gland is intact and this gland is intact. So it seems like it's a proliferation through, not from, okay? Through my gastric pits, not from my gastric pits, okay? So this mm -hmm. is a thing that will trigger your mind to look for, to do stain. Of course, we are biased because we already know that this patient has, um, uh, uh, lobular cancer. So I'm going to go to the H and E stain. I'm hoping that this is an ER or PR. Okay. It's a keratin. They only did a keratin, which is not giving me anything new. Okay. I mean, I know that this is a, I mean, that this is all tumor. See how it's infiltrating through your, um, yeah. Um, it's pretty good. Your next step is definitely going to be breast markers and mm -hmm. looking at the patient's history and, um, it's, uh, pretty single cells. It's pretty ugly. Um, I have a case. Uh, I've been getting it for the past four years, uh, metastatic lobular cancer, uh, to every single biopsy from that patient. Poor lady, esophagus, stomach, colon, duodenum, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, anal. Um, every six months she gets screened and I have the exact same picture. Of course, uh, the first year um, I was here, I kept staining everything. And then it was just consistent with 50 patients. I stopped staining, stopped everything because it just, yeah, and the patient's still alive. I had one a couple of weeks ago from her. Okay, uh, hepatitis, Crohn's disease, ileocecal valve, let's see. So um, I believe that um, nice. So this is a nice, this is a nice Crohn's. Okay. So this one here, um, again, small bowel, look for pyloric gland metaplasia. You see it in the middle here. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are probably 10 glands only, but this is a sign of chronicity. Okay. Train your eye for inflamed ileal cecal valve or inflamed small bowel to look for chronicity signs, which is the pyloric gland metaplasia. That's rule number one. Rule number two, let's look for activity. We look further, of course, it's all ulcerated eroded. This is active chronic active ileitis with surface erosion. All right, now, what do I have here? Yes. I do have epithelioid granulomas, deep-seated, nice epithelioid granulomas. So um, classic, classic, classic. Of course, if it's a first-time diagnosis, I want to do AFD, GMS, but it's unlikely to be positive because it is non-necrotizing type. And with that, um, with everything happening around here, this is uh, Crohn's disease. So my, my diagnostic line will be, if I am the first one to give her the diagnosis, okay, it's going to be chronic active ileitis with surface erosion period, multiple epithelioid granulomas present in the lamina, in the submucosa. Here in next line, see comment. In my comment section, I'll say no CMV, no, no dysplasia. Um, this is, uh, um, this is uh, um, in favor of inflammatory bowel disease, comma, and specifically Crohn's disease in the appropriate clinical setting. Okay, so that's what I would say. I would favor it if I'm the first time who was giving it. And then if the patient comes back in six months, blah, 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 and she still has the same thing and more biopsies of the lower and everything, and we have granulomas, and then the patient has established diagnosis. Okay, 
So if you are the first one to give the diagnosis, always say in favor of, don't outline it as the first diagnostic line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what else? Um, okay, before I move on, I know that this is not uh, my, my uh, field, but I want to show you echinococcus uh, cysts. Um, you know the multi-lamination. I just had I had a case one during my residency, and I want to. Oh, there it is. You see that? Yeah. That's, that's the nice. tooth. Yeah, that's the hooks of the echinococcus. So always, uh, I had a cytology actually. It was a cytology aspirate, and it was filled with those hooks and teeth, and it was very cool. Okay. Um, intense portal. Signature. Signet ring cell. Okay, perfect. Oh, there is a CMV in the colon as well. Okay, let's see. Where's your CMV? Yes, this one. Let's start with this one first. Okay, CMV colitis. Okay, before 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 jumping to the diagnosis. Okay, let's look on low power. I have chronicity. The reason I know it's chronic because I see my my um, crypt architecture is disturbed. Look here, mm -hmm. this one in particular, this group here, I have crypt dropout, I have crypt architecture distortion, and I almost have a, a perpendicular to the, to the muscularis growth. So crypt branching, crypt distortion, this is all signs of chronic. So chronic, of course, active, colitis mm -hmm. with ulcer and erosion, no dysplasia, because I don't see darkness anywhere. And then I look nicely and I see my inclusions. Very nice. My C CMV inclusions. This is the big one that has more nuclear and cytoplasmic. You see it? And then mm -hmm. this one yeah. here, and this one here, and, uh, and this one here, and this one here. It's loaded. It's loaded with CMV. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, and um, when I look at my ulcer, I look at them at the eye that I will find CMV, okay? Right, the reason is, it's so easy to overlook it, okay? Always double doubt yourself. Every time, if you feel like the background is good for it, double doubt yourself. Say, I am wrong, I am wrong, I have to find it, I have to find it, and that will make sure that you will look even more careful and careful, okay? Let me move on. So that was a nice and neat case. Let me go back to signet ring cell carcinoma. Let's start. It seems like this is a stomach biopsy. Okay, so we're looking at the stomach. Nice and beautiful. And then, wait, it's lagging a little bit. Okay. This is, this is um, quite disturbing because it's not, not um, uh, not straightforward, okay? It's one of those very scary gastric cancers. But uh, this whole thing here, if you did the keratin, these are all gonna be positive, mm -hmm. okay? It's almost like histiocytic-like, see that? These are all, this one here and this one here, this one here, these are all signet ring. It's very small. These are very small cells, okay? And these are all positive. Let me show you even further. Yeah, the nightmare of a GI pathologist. What about the practicing non-GI pathologist? You, well, I'm <laughs> telling even you, even bigger nightmare. It's uh, it's so easy to miss. These are all signet rings. Yeah, that is nice. See, yeah. see them. These are all signet rings. They are infiltrating inside. Some of them look like just like just like lumen. These are nice. Look, there are two side by side. Yeah. Okay, subtle. All scary. these cases are so extensive that I mean it's tough to be missed. But the yes. tricky ones are where the focus. The small biopsies. Yeah, the yeah. tricky ones are the small biopsies. Um, I, I agree. Now we're gonna look. Hope probably that's the lymph node with meds. Okay, so just by low power. I see three lymph nodes here. Probably this has nothing, but these two appear to be positive. I will look 
um, further on all three of them. Of course, I'm not a hematopathologist, you guys. Uh, and it's subcapsular. See how? Mm -hmm. It's uh, subcapsular. I remember from my best breast fellowship. Oh my God, how much we used to look subcapsular. It was like the to-go place when we are on frozen. Um, yeah, so this is these are just the two positives. Um, uh, and let's see. I oh yeah, this whole thing is positive actually. I I thought it was like a reactive. This whole thing is actually uh, right. Yeah. These are these are positive. Yeah, for signet ring cell carcinoma. Look at this beautiful one here. Okay. Okay. So moving on. Tough, but. I mean, the, the toughest part about the signet ring is how small these cells are. Some of them are big and nice, but some of them are very small. Okay, anus, primary melanoma. Oh my gosh. I don't think I'll be able to make that diagnosis with skin. But uh, I will try. Okay, not, not too difficult, right? You're gonna do all your stains. Fox 10, melanie, whatever, whatever. But this is definitely a, a neoplastic process in the squamous mucosa of the anus. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? It's uh, it's not like a, yeah, I mean, it, this is definitely malignant, right? And I won't be doing anything without doing my, my, my markers. I would definitely do markers on this one. Um, let's see if they have a marker. Here's my melanin. It's not loaded. Oh, perfect. You see it, guys? Okay, that's beautiful. Melanin positive melanoma. Okay, what else? Um, stomach, well differentiated endocarcinoma arising in H. pylori gastritis and atrophic gastritis. Okay. No, I think I clicked on the other side. Yeah. So he said that we have a neuroendocrine tumor. It's not here. It's not here. Oh, I need to find it. The lymphoid aggregate. This is definitely atrophic. Okay, I have mm. no syntax. You see how if you train your eye to look for atrophy, you'll find it right away. And he is scaring me because he said there is carcinoid. Or, or did he say uh, adenocarcinoma? I think he said adenocarcinoma. Oh my God, I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, now okay. this makes sense, right? This is an adenocarcinoma. Yeah. Here, it does make sense. You have a gastric mucosa and you have, but you know what? Just because of the history of autoimmune, my mind mm -hmm. just read the carcinoma as carcinoid because that's what we're, we're used to. Doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, right? Yeah, it's like, this is a classic um, mental uh, freeze for me. But um, okay, so you're having here adenocarcinoma and there's no ifs and buts around it. This is a, um, an intestinal type, that's the type of adenocarcinoma. And did he say that there was H. pylori too, right? Yeah, not now. He said there's H. pylori and um, we can always look for it. Yeah, we don't need to. So we don't, if you don't need to, but I, um, yeah, you, you definitely can see it on H and E if you want to, but there, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, definitely. and the reason why uh, there is H. pylori, look at how nice lymphoid aggregates you have. Uh, one, mm. two, three, four, five, six. That, that's uh, when I see lymphoid aggregates in stomachs, I always uh, I want to make sure I'm not missing an H. pylori because it's a nice one. Even Helicobacter hermanii is also one thing, which is not the H. pylori, the other type. Um, I actually have a case today from it. Um, um, I'm planning to, I'm, I'm actually setting aside since we started this, um, few cases to show you. I already have six or seven on the slide to go through with you guys. I'm just waiting until I get the, a microscope. Oh, I'm sorry, a, a camera for my microscope or I use my, my friend's camera. We'll see. 
Okay. That's very nice of you. Thank you very much. Um, so autoimmune type atrophic gastritis. The reason I want to show this really quick is just because if they have immunostains, ooh, beautiful. So um, let me see the H and E first. So that's the H and E. Hopefully, yes, this is the H and E. So this is the H and E. Again, you guys have to get out from here, experts in AMAG. Okay. <laughs> so this is um, uh, a body with lots of atrophy, lots of intestinal metaplasia, and Panath cell metaplasia. You see those Panath cells? Mm -hmm. So you have both Panath cells, you have uh, IM, and then you look around, you look around, and you don't have any bo other body biopsy. It looks all the same origin of antrum or antralyze. Now you order your chromogranin, and your classic chromogranin is nodular and linear. Nodular, which is like, like little nodules, linear is this one. And definition of linear, you have to have more than five cells side by side, and you definitely have more here. One, two, three, four, five. Here's more, here's more. Then, but five of them have to touch each other. Um, so you have linear and nodular proliferation of enterochromatin cells with associated intestinal metaplasia and cell metaplasia. Findings are most seen in either autoimmune gastritis, atrophic gastritis, or helicobacter uh, pylori, given the absence of helicobacter pylori infection with the, I, with the immunostain. This is in favor of autoimmune gastritis, please correlation with serology, okay? And they will do intrinsic factor and all of that. So it's, just, it's very good. And then you, you don't need to count because for me here, I don't see any carcinoids. I just see the nodular hyperplasia. When, when do I count, okay? When do I count? I count when, first of all, he sees a polyp endoscopically. He tells me that this is a polyp or a nodule. And then I would see all of these groups are actually infiltrating the lamina propria upwards. So right now you see how they are on the base. Mm -hmm. And then the enterochromaffin cells, those nodules will become infiltrating all the way to the top, okay? Or they will actually make a nodular like it's bigger, it's much bigger, more than five microns. So it is, uh, that's when you start counting and you have to keep an eye. Otherwise, we're just gonna call it ECL cell hyperplasia consistent with AMAC, okay? And no carcinoma, carcinoid. I didn't know it was my favorite topic, but it seems like it is. Okay, now uh, gallbladder, stomach. Okay, chronic active gastritis with H. pylori. We're gonna look at this. It's simple, but... Um, but is you, it common to have H. pylori in case of chronic active, uh, chronic atrophic gastritis? No, but no, abs, no, it's not as well. H. pylori is not uncommon, so yes, they could happen together. Okay, mm -hmm. but H. pylori is so common that it will make us make the stomach look like AMAC. So when mm -hmm. you don't have H. pylori and you have something looks like AMAC, tell them to do serology and rule out, a, you know, an AMAC. But if mm -hmm. you have an AMAG, yes, you can still have H. pylori. And, the re and what you can do here is you ask the doctor to treat it and rebiopsy after three months. If the stomach ex looks exactly the same, then you are pretty much more establishing an AMAG diagnosis. Okay? okay. All right. So this is uh, H. pylori gastritis. And even without an H. pylori immunostain, you can oh. H. pylori. Okay? So this is a nice, uh, a nice look. Of course, when you see that, always try to rule out IM, intestinal metaplasia. And uh, don't forget, look at two pieces because IM is also one of the findings in H. pylori gastritis. Okay, and this is negative for intestinal metaplasia. All right, sorry, my obsession. Okay, so um, now we were going to look for the, probably the H. pylori immunostain. Um, I'm hoping. Yes. They, why did they even perform the stain? I don't perform the stain if I found it. Yeah, I never, it's like a protein there. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I never do a immunostain if I found it. Okay. So, um, duodenum CMV associated superficial injury. 
and this has three um, three slides. Okay. So confirm it's a duodenum. Here is my nas Brunner glands. Now I have flattened villi. We have surface ulceration. Here um, you have good Sati, Can I interrupt and ask a of question? Course, of course. Uh, so what do you do if the, uh, in, it's probably just a technical question, if the clinician indicates that this biopsy was specifically s s taken because he saw friable gastric mucosa and he wants to rule, uh, and it's for, uh, quote, helicobacter pylori testing, mm -hmm. but when you looked at it, it looks just like chronic gastritis with, like, you know, very focal, like mild chronic gastritis, and you're thinking that, you know, H. pylori is probably going to be negative. But mm -hmm. since he quoted that he needed H. pylori testing, do you order your immunostains or you rely on H. 100% I order it. 100%. Okay, yeah. Yes. Some H. pylori gives us very minimal inflammation. Okay. <laughs> So okay, okay, always right. keep an eye. Yeah. I, again, I don't know if I told you my practice, we do H. pylori up front. So I always, always have H. pylori, except for one center. The, the center is charity and they do cash payers. So for that, um, we never order H. pylori up front. So when I see H, so that one, I will actually look much carefully on my H. &E, and I will only order H. pylori immunostain if I really, really, really think it was positive and I don't see it. Otherwise, I'll make my diagnosis without an H, without an immunostain. But yeah, so, in my practice, it makes it easy. I we have H. pylori up front, um, not on all the biopsies, just the antrums or the ulcers. Okay. So all the antrums, all the ulcers, without even looking at the biopsy, yeah. you have the yeah. stain. I have it. It comes on the on, comes on the same strain. with the with the slide. Yeah. Yes, okay. it comes on the train. Does it get reimbursed like with the, the yes. of people like yeah. it gets? It's, yes, here in California. I heard, I heard somewhere that uh, you have to have a kind of moderate uh, chronic active gastritis in order to uh, in order to get it reimbursed. I don't know if it is in certain states, but uh, um, I, it might be in certain states because I know when I first yeah. uh, started my job here in California, they they did mm -hmm. the the. The VP, when he met with me, he said, we, we get reimbursed for our H. pylori. That's why we have them up front. However, right. um, it's only on one, one, uh, one, uh, one, one, yeah, on two. one part. If we yeah. have it six parts, he's only, mm -hmm. we're only going to get one reimbursement. Right. Okay. Um, and so this one is, he's, he mentioned that this is a duodenum and we agree. They have Brunner gland here. And then we have um, active duodenitis. See all of these neutrophils inside. Excuse mm. me. And we have some blunting ulceration. Let's look at my neg my other one. This looks like a clean, very nice and clean duodenum. This this particular part has nothing in it, so it's probably more. It's distant from the eroded area that he um, biopsied earlier. So. Um, now that he mentioned it could be a CMV, let's practice and see if we can see CMV inclusions. And obviously all of these are gonna turn out to be positive. This one, mm -hmm. this one, these five in a row. Let's, let's mm -hmm. see. And this is my CMV. And that's the exact focus where we were looking at earlier. And all of these are CMV positive. My gosh, how beautiful it is. When oh, that's the most exuberant CMV I know, I know. I've seen. <laughs> so rewarding. So rewarding to see it. Mm -hmm. um, this is another level of the same area. Okay. All right. Now we're moving on. Um, granular cell polyp. There's a malignant chest there. Cool. Let's do the malignant chest first. All right, now location. Location is probably a small bowel mm -hmm. or maybe colon, let's see. Because it's so exuberant. Yeah, it's probably a small bowel and then you have this huge spindle or not even spindle to me this looks more epithelioid 
Okay, so you have to do your stains. Dog one. What are, what are the criteria for malignant gist? Apart from mitosis? Yeah, uh, location. No, I think uh, uh, um, I haven't done excisions in a long time, but I think you have to do the mitosis, the location matters, the mitosis, mm -hmm. the location and the size, right? And that is the, okay. the differentiation between uh, whether or not you are dealing with uh, a, a high grade or, um, or, mal or a, a, a tumor of unknown uh, behavior, or you know what? Um, I'm blinking out. Yeah, un unknown, unknown potential. Thing. Potential, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but definitely, if it was in the small bowel, it's worse than the um, stomach. Mm -hmm. And uh, the size more than, I think the cutoff is two, and the mitosis is 20. Mm -hmm. um, don't quote me for that, but this is, these are probably the things yeah, that I can remember from my boards. Okay, now we're doing the, but definitely do, do all your just markers, dog one, 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 seven. Mm -hmm. um, granular cell polyp. Dr. Alsatya, how often do you do uh, IHC for HDH? For the what? Succ Succinic dehydrogenase? For, um, for, no, I don't do it. Okay. Mm -hmm granular cell polyp. So I'm assuming these are all granular cells mm -hmm. and they are going to be an S100 positive. Let's see what they have here. All right, there you go. Whoa, very exuberant, very strong. And this very... one is so purple compared to the ones that I've seen. I know, oh, right? That's why yeah. I kept looking at it. I mean, it looks almost like a, <laughs> I didn't want to miss a carcinoid on this one. I would definitely yeah. do all my uh, synapto and chromo and, yeah. you know, it's just too, um, it's not my classic, but I feel like he put it there because um, look how granular those, the cytoplasm mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I am at Now that he, now that I look at it, okay. Mm -hmm. It's always nice to keep that in the back of your mind. Sometimes not everything is black and white. But yeah, for this one, it's good. The S100 is very nice. Well, there's also something called malignant granular cell tumor. Is it because it's very infiltrative? So I think those are the ones. Do we have it here? Did you? Well, did I was you... just looking at it. Uh, maybe not. Okay. So tubular carcinoma. Nice, right? Because we're looking at a gastric mucosa. And then you have in situ and low grade dysplasia, and then you have the adenocarcinoma. So, what, what's nice about the classification of gastric adenocarcinoma is you have to know it's very important for you to say whether or not this is signet ring differentiation versus tubular uh, or, um, or the diffuse type. The diffuse type is the one that could be with signet ring or no signet ring. Sometimes you call this poorly differentiated gastric adenocarcinoma comma diffuse type or moderately to well differentiated gastric adenocarcinoma comma tubular type, okay, which is this one. See how beautiful this is? It's infiltrating all the way inside. It's crossing the, the muscularis. It's almost reaching all the way to the submucosa or adventitia of the stomach. See what that? They're almost you can have satellite legions. You never know, maybe this is gonna turn out to be positive. These are all metastatic nodules or direct direct extension nodules. Um, so um, for me immediately on this one, I will do a HER2 just uh, for, for, for uh, management purposes. Okay. Um, I think uh, that's the only one they have on it. Okay. Um, melanoma. We already did melanoma, uh, myomyoma of the stomach. That's a nice one, nice and simple, isn't it? Mm. Okay, but I will never, ever, ever in my whole life find a myoma of the stomach without doing a CD117, okay? Mm -hmm. Because even how benign and bland this look is, this looks, 
gist with spindle cell differentiation will look identical. Okay, so just because the location of the gist is most common in the stomach, I would definitely do a 117, a Desmond, and uh, a dog one, and I will call this negative four gist markers. And so it does consist mm -hmm. of a lyomyoma. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my lyomyoma, I will also mention there is no evidence of frank mitosis, ATP, or necrosis. Okay. Um, Musmucin assist, serous cyst. Now, should I move on to the next page? There's this uh, appendix, mucin assisted in the cause. Where is it? Uh, this go one? Down. Go down. Okay. No, go down, down in the last uh, last appendix. Here, mucin assisted adenoma. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I do in my practice um, get uh, uh, pancreas, I told you, right? Okay. Let's oh, see. you do pancreas? I do FNAs of pancreas, okay. not sections. So very uh, so more of a cytology, mm. which is very difficult. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So this is appendix. These are abnormal proliferation okay, mm. within the wall of the appendix. Let's go here. Look at that. It's, it's, I mean, this is no way normal, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you can see that mucinous proliferation of the epithelium. And definitely this is neoplastic process, that they call it, uh, carcinoid tumor. So, so we have both here, right? You have a mucinous cystadenoma of the epithelium and then we have a carcinoid tumor nearby. All right. So beautiful. It is, uh, what they call it, co col uh, colloid, what, not, what is it? Col when they collide. Yeah, col col collision, collision tumor. Tumor. Okay. Yeah. Next. Um, ileum Crohn's disease. Okay. So even without looking, I am thinking I need to find my granulomas. I need to find my uh, antral um, uh, pyloric gland metaplasia and active colitis, right? So, so that's the criteria that comes to my mind. If you have that in your mind, that list, GI pathology becomes so, so simple. Now, granulomas, check, mm -hmm. right? Let's see my pyloric gland metaplasia. And by the way, granuloma is a sign of chronicity. So you will say chronic ileitis, chronic active ileitis, even without pyloric gland metaplasia. If you saw, if you found granuloma, look at that. This is my pyloric metaplasia. See that? Okay. So now I have pyloric gland metaplasia, and I have my granuloma, and my activity is here, ileitis. See that? So. Mm -hmm. I have the criteria that fulfills it. Now, I don't ignore my granulomas. I need to see if they are epithelioid or necrotizing because also in terminal ileum, that's where you see um, uh, exactly. Here you have a nice multinucleated giant cell in the middle, but none of it looks like, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, necrotizing to me, okay? Okay, all right, mm. moving on. Um, lyomyosarcoma, okay, I would definitely not diagnose that for sure on my own, but why not if we can look at it together, maybe you guys will help me because soft tissue was something that is not something that I like. Okay, so that's the h &E. Okay, again, I did mention that I look for mitosis, I look for necrosis, I look for atypia, but um, remember that entity with atypical lyomyoma or lyomyoma of borderline uh, uh, cellular. But uh, yeah, this one is very, very high in mitosis. So this one is yeah. like not this, those where you have yes. to. 
I mean, there is plenty of mic posters everywhere. You guys can yeah. hear construction near me? Say again? You guys can hear the construction near me? There is lots of noise on the side. Nothing, no. zero. Okay, good. Zero. Okay, this is the Desmond. Okay, so we know that we're dealing with lyomyoma. And this is the thicket, which tells me that this is not okay. So um, thicket negative, Desmond positive, high mitosis. He's calling it lyomyosarcoma. What, what did he call it? Yes, he called it lyomyosarcoma. I would definitely be opening my books and looking at the criteria of calling it lyomyosarcoma and uh, adding a reference <laughs> for my for my report. Um, which I do that very often if it's not something that I do um, frequently. Like I, I've never called lyomyosarcoma yet. Okay, uh, benign fibroblastic polyp. Let me close these first. One, two, three. Um, just wanna let you know, ladies, I need another 15 minutes for me to go or 20 minutes basically. Just, um, okay, so we're gonna go faster here. Okay. Benign fibroblastic polyp is pretty much the other name of perineurioma. You will do an EMA and all that spindle cell proliferation is going to be weakly, but positive for uh, um, EMA. And let's see, do they have a stain here? No. And um, I will also do an S100 to rule out a mucosal Schwann cell hamartoma. Bread and butter of pathology, nothing else. Benign, you don't have to sweat about, around it. Um, okay, so this one is a nice one. Meckles with ectopic gastric and eudinal mucosa. So what do I have to see first to call it meckles? Before, before we open our slide, I wanna see colonic mucosa, which is not, not colonic, sorry, small bowel mucosa. And then to call it Meckles, I want to see duodenal and gastric. Let's see if we're going to have that. Okay. So we have small bowel or terminal ilium because it's going to be two inches from the ileocecal valve, right? And then we have gastric foveolar and oxyntic. So that's heterotropia, right? Because if you only have foveolar, this is metaplasia. If you have foveolar and oxyntic, this is heterotropia. And then let's see my, he did say duodenal, right? So I want to see if I have, or did he say pancreatic? Um, uh, Meckles, gastric and duodenal mucosa. Interesting. I was expecting a pancreas. But if he wants us to find duodenal type mucosa, let's find it. There you go, Brunner's gland, saw that? Mm -hmm. All right, so beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice nickel. So can you again um, uh, mm -hmm. clarify that heterotopia versus uh, metaplasia? metaplasia okay. Topic? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, let's, let's walk through it together. You look at the junction, okay? Let's look at the junction. Where's my junction? Because the junction is gonna tell you what's happening. So you walk through the junction, you're walking here and you saw um, uh, enteric type or in, you know terminal ileum or whatever, ileal type mucosa or small bowel mucosa and you go further and here your your mucosa becomes a little bit foveolar at the top you're becoming to have like almost like foveolar metaplasia here okay mm -hmm. so you can simply call this foveolar metaplasia and move on which is sometimes you can see in small bowel biopsies but when you look further in the lamina propria, you don't only have the foveolar metaplasia, you have a lot of oxyntic mucosa. So mm -hmm. it's as if there is, a, it's as if a biopsy from a, a stomach body, okay? Yes. So that's why you're calling it heterotropia. You're not, it's not a metaplastic, it's not a reactive slash metaplastic process where the body is uh, changing from one organ to the other to adapt to some uh, um, uh, acidity differences in, or infection. No, it's actually uh, um, a heterotropic mucosa because I have all the elements of a stomach, okay? An oxygen, an epithelium, 
the whole thing with its lamina propria. So that's mm -hmm. the difference between heterotropia and foveolar metaplasia, okay? Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, we're moving on. And I have seen uh, McCall's with uh, um, H. pylori. So I have seen H. pylori in, 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 um, in McCall's. All right, atrophic gastritis consistent with autoimmune type nodular endocrine cells metaplasia. Again, we are uh, covering a lot of AMAG here, which is really good for you ladies. And so let's move on. So this is antralyzed. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about differentiating antralyzed versus non-antralyzed, but it seems like even without looking on, H, on, on my immunostain, I want you to focus these groups are going to be all positive for chromogranin or synaptophysin. Okay, these are all almost like a, a mini carcinoid about to start. Okay, and you can easily do it on H and E. Look at that. This whole thing is a little carcinoid nodule. Okay, mm -hmm. over here. So um, that's how you do the ECL cell hyperplasia. You have to, this is for sure I'll be counting. Remember when I told you my ECL cells? will go all the way to the top. And that's mm -hmm. a nice example. They're crawling up, they are merging together and they're nodulizing, they're forming nodules. Um, let's look at the, uh, the stain that he has for this. Um, no, it's up, 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 up. Did I move? Yeah. In the okay, here, here, this one. Okay, so no, it's probably, no. they're both H and E. They're both H and E. Yeah, they're both H and E. Okay, so we don't have a chromome, but it's uh, it's okay. Um, uh, I, I think on H and E, it's clear that you see them, right? It's um, when you say counting, what do you mean by that? If I missed, I think a little part before. No, it's okay. So um, I have to put up again the criteria to um, carcinoid versus uh, uh, micronodular hyperplasia. It's uh, you have to start counting some of your nodules and what's the, 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 the biggest nodule, um, five millimeter versus more than five versus less than five. And that will change the, the like, like when do you call it carcinoid? You know, like microcarcinoids versus carcinoids in patients with AMAG is very critical. That that's when you have to count. Um, yeah, it's, it, there is a table online, I think. Um, can we quickly go through if we can find that table? Yeah, like the when we call it micro versus carcinoma. Yeah. Maybe pathology outlines. Microcarcinoid. AMAG. Uh, I think it's a table. It had to be a table. Um, If you can't find it, that's fine. I will, um, uh, I will try to find it. Uh, okay, so um, how about uh, I come next time prepared for that question and I will, uh, we'll go over it, okay? I'll, I'll put a note on me, my thing to prepare for carcinoid, okay. I will, I promise we'll, we'll go over it next time, okay? Which is probably yeah. tomorrow, maybe. Yeah. All right, so um, let's move on. Uh, all right, carcinoid tumor in the ampulla. And it's something that I see frequently, okay? So um, because we get duodenal ampullary biopsies, and I think this is a very straightforward one. It's, uh, well, not, not too straightforward because they look a little ugly, but again, they are nodular. There's a lot of um, uh, spacing and artifact and these uh, almost looks like a micropapillary kind of lesion. But um, yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a nice biopsy of the ampulla. Um, of course, they did all the stains to make sure that it's the true carcinoid before. And this is more just to confirm that we are in an ampullary tissue. 
Okay. So the terminology these days is well differentiated neuroendocrine or it's like we call it carcinoid? Um, no, no. I only use the word carcinoid in rectum because it's still used. Okay. Okay. Well differentiated. Uh, so uh, in the rectum, it's uh, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, comma, grade one, open parentheses, rectal carcinoid. And that's the only time I use it. Otherwise, carcinoid, I never use it. Okay. I only use uh, neuroendocrine tumor, well differentiated, moderately or poorly did. Um, and they don't have uh, uh, stains on this one. Eosinophilic esophagitis. Okay. To me, eosinophilic esophagitis starts with low power. Okay. You look at it, you look, you see the epithelium is so blue. Why is it so blue? Because there is ECL cell hyperplasia. I'm sorry, not EC cells, basal cell hyperplasia. Okay. Don't don't get uh, don't get dragged to counting your EOS first. Make sure the background is correct. Okay. So first of all, you have ECL cell. Um, why am I saying ECL? You have the basal cell hyperplasia, and then you have all the papil papillary proliferation here with spongiosis. So these are all. See those spacing between these cells. These are. This is all spongiosis. So I say I have basal cell hyperplasia. I have spongiosis. I might have scattered lymphocytes as well, but pretty much for the most part, I have eosinophilic rich esophagitis, okay? So again, if the patient has history, it, my diagnostic line will be consistent with eosinophilic esophagitis. If the patient has no history, I'll say eosinophilic rich esophagitis, comma, C comment. In my comment, I'll say that eosinophilic count is so high, greater than 90, this is in favor of eosinophilic esophagitis in the appropriate clinical setting, i.e. if the endoscopically you can see linear furrows, if the patient has dysphagia and so forth. And, um, and otherwise you have to rule out reflux because severe reflux can have a lot of eos, okay? Keep that in mind. So I have eosinophilic microabscesses here, eosinophilic degranulation, um, which are all nice signs for eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, but, but that's it for the most part. I will not go further in anything else. I might do a fungal stain because um, the patient with eosinophilic esophagitis can have strictures and can the food may um, get stuck. Uh, the mucosa might be eroded. It might be a good place for candida to survive. Um, so you need to also make sure that you're not dealing with candida. Okay, question? How would the, um, <clears throat> how would be differentiated from reflux if it, if it also has a lot of, you know, is okay. it just a number? N yeah, no, so um, number one, number. Number two, uh, endoscopic findings. Number three, go, number three, soft sign. Um, if the EOs are pretty much on the surface, I favor reflux. If they're on the base, I favor um, uh, eosinophilic. Okay, but uh, it's a very soft sign. Of course, you don't want, if you have the, the, the nice uh, biopsies, like you have distal, mid, and proximal, and you have more eos in the proximal than the distal, then you're probably dealing with eosinophilic, eosinophilic esophagitis. However, if you have a clean proximal, a clean mid, but your distal is very inflamed, it's basal cell hyperplasia, it's spongiosis, it's high EOs, this one where, where you have to be giving a differential for the most part, okay? Thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, ulcerative pancolitis with foci of low grade and high grade dysplasia. You know what? This is scary. I... Um, I mean, there is already pancolitis, and now he wants to call it low grade and high grade. This is my my biggest fear because it's so difficult. No, but I agree. This is quite inflamed, but quite atypical. This is here high grade dysplasia. See that? Mm -hmm. This focus here is pretty much high grade dysplasia, and. Uh, just to be honest with you, I'm looking for neutrophils within, within those crypts, and I don't see them. I know the inflammation is all around it, but if you look at this one in particular, or this one, or this one, I don't see neutrophils inside it. So it's high-grade dysplasia, and intra-epithelial neutrophils are absent. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried. 
okay? If I have intraepithelial neutrophils, I worry, I kind of favor reactive or kind of back off. But when I don't have intraepithelial neutrophils, I kind of become a little bit more worried. Again, look how this plastic, this is mitosis, 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 and nuclei are so large and there is lots of prominent nucleoli. Okay, now let's look. So he called it pancolitis. Okay, and let's look for low grade dysplasia. If he mentions that there is low grade dysplasia, very difficult. I mean, sometimes, or actually, most of the time, high grade dysplasia is easier to diagnose than low grade, by the way, because high grade is um, that's it, it's there, it's everywhere. Um, maybe here you have a focus of low grade. And here you have a focus of high grade. Why would you need to mention the low grade if you already have the high grade? Because he, I don't need to, but he did mention it in his description. He said ulcerative pancolitis with foci of low and high. So I was curious to find the low. Okay. Uh, which may be here. But if you have high grade dysplasia, that's all that you need to write in your diagnostic line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which we have here. All right. Next is. Uh, where are we? Okay, adeno, adenovirus inclusions in gastric mucosa. Now that I haven't seen yet. But let's see the H and E. Okay, antro mucosa and. I don't see IM. Okay. I will do a level. I want to make sure this is not an IM. And then he did mention that there is adenovirus. Maybe here. I don't know. Let's see. It's uh, it's scary. Let's see here at his adeno. Oh, plenty, plenty of adenopositive. Let's look at the H and E again. My God, which makes me think: Did I ever miss it? Because I don't. Well, it's not as common. Yeah, and then it is the inflammation is also not that good as well. Yeah, probably this is one here. I remember when we used to study for adeno, um, they look like smudged cells, smudged nuclei. Here is another one here. I think this is one here. Okay. All right. Um, I will do one more. And um, which one should we do? The granular cell tumor of the esophagus? Let's do that. Okay, that that's not as difficult, right? Because you can see all of these uh, pink eosinophilic granules and uh, definitely it has to come to your mind to rule it out. So you will do your S100 and um, you will rule it out. Um, granular cell tumor of the esophagus. Let me give you an overview. The esophagus here has some spongiosis. See that? Um, but I don't see as much basal cell hyperplasia. There is nice maturation here. The surface doesn't have any activity. And I will not order uh, fungal stains on this one because it doesn't seem like to be a reactive. Um, just to make sure not to miss your basics on esophagus before we move on to the elephant in the house. Um, did you see the difference between this and this, the eosinophilic esophagitis? Remember how the eosinophilic esophagitis, the thickness of the squamous epithelium is much less. It's pretty much half of it is basal cell hyperplasia with spongiosis and very little maturation. And the matured area is filled with eos and it's, there's eos everywhere. It almost looked to me, to my eyes, like an immature esophagus. Um, all right. 
then we have SNR cell carcinoma, no, uh, autoimmune gastritis. We've done so many of these. Uh, normal from patients with Giardia. Duodenum normal with patients with Giardia. So let's see. I think we've seen, we've seen one yesterday or the day before of Giardia. Um, yeah, I don't know why you see that Giardia, but the reason why he called it normal because the, the, the duodenum will look normal to the clinician and to you, okay? So keep an eye, any normal duodenum, go high. And you see the leaf-like whatever, these are all Giardia bugs. Okay. Um, okay, it is 3.15. I think you have to go, right? I do have to go. I do have to go. But let's remember where we stopped here so we can do Yeah, Giardia. Okay. And I will, I will look into the um, table for the microcarcinoids. And I will also look at the histoplasmosis one, the one that I couldn't pick up for here. Okay? Thank you very much. Very, very much. You are very, very welcome. I'll see you tomorrow, ladies. And um, I don't know what time will be... Uh, there, I will uh, communicate with Akanksha, but maybe sometime similar to what we did today, okay? Sounds like a plan. Thank you. All right, no problem. Take care. You too. Bye -bye. Yeah.